Well, this is lecture 20 of our uh, algebraic structures. There's nobody in the classroom but me and the camera person. Uh, that's because we're making an extra lecture. Today is Thursday, March 29, 2018. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're doing an extra lecture since I gave them time off before spring break because um, I went on out of town. So what are we going to do in this lecture? We're going to do proofs related to fact groups and internal direct products that we, like we've been talking about recently. And then we're going to talk about a new concept of group homomorphism, not a group isomorphism, but a group homomorphism. Definition, basic examples, and properties. I'm going to go pretty fast, a lot faster than I typically do when I actually have a class of people here, because when I have people here, I want to interact, look at people's eyes, look and see if they're tracking with me. I'm going to go pretty fast, so if you are take, watching this, taking notes, you're probably going to want to be ready to pause it every once in a while and write down things uh, to give yourself a little bit more time. But I am going to try to finish in 50 minutes or so here if I can. A uh, quick reminder, exam two for here in 2018 is Friday of next week. Um, and it, again, the majority will be chapters five through 10, though there will be some things from earlier chapters, though probably those extra things from earlier chapters will be to use for the ideas from the later chapters. All right, uh, we did look at this last slide in lecture 19, applications of the factor groups to the study of groups. I'm going to quickly go over this, and then we're going to look at some proofs of these things in this lecture. There is this thing called the GZ theorem. It says if G is a group and Z of G is the center of G, then if this factor group is cyclic, it follows that G is abelian. Okay, let this thing sink in, think about it a bit. This is actually, again, kind of a strange little theorem. It also implies that if this factor group, G mod ZG, is cyclic, it actually must be trivial. It can't be a non-trivial cyclic group, which is maybe a little strange that that is the case. Why couldn't it be a non-trivial cyclic group? Well, this GZ theorem claims it can't be. Make sure you understand the implication here. Because if G is a billion, the center is going to be all of G. That's why this factor group, group would be, the, be trivial. You can turn it around. You can think about the contrapositive. If G is not abelian, then this can't be cyclic. Alternatively, if this factor group is not trivial, then in, in fact the factor group can't be cyclic. The only kinds of things that you can have here with this kind of factor group are non-cyclic groups. This only becomes significant once we get to order six. If you make a little table here with the different orders along the side here, and isomorphism classes in the next column. There's only one group of order one, the trivial group. You could call that Z1, I guess. We hardly ever use that notation. You could just call it E as well. Up to isomorphism, there's only one group of order two, Z2. Same for Z3, two and three are prime. For order four, there's two groups up to isomorphism. It could be cyclic, isomorphic to Z4, or the external direct product of Z2 with itself. There's only one group of order five up to isomorphism, that's Z5, because five is prime. Order six, we saw before, there are two groups, Z6 and D3, which is also isomorphic to S3, the dihedral group symmetries of an equilateral triangle, and S3, the symmetric group on three objects, those are isomorphic. And these are the only two isomorphism classes for groups of order six. So this, but up through order five, all the groups are abelian. So this fact only becomes, starts to become significant once we get to groups of order six or higher. Okay. You can also say, if G happens to be a non-abelian group of order P times Q, where P and Q are distinct primes, then the center must be trivial because if it were of order, well, it can't be order P, Q because G is non-abelian. If it were order P or Q, that would be a problem because it would mean this factor group would be cyclic. And factor groups by the center can't be cyclic. That's what this means. A related fact is that the factor group of G by its center is isomorphic to the group of inner automorphisms of G. We'll look at the proof of this as well. And then we'll also look at the proof of this theorem, which is a partial converse of Grange's theorem. Cauchy's theorem for abelian groups, if G is a finite abelian group and P is a prime and divides the order of G, then G has an element and then, of course, a subgroup as well, 
of order p. If x is an element of order p, then the subgroup, cyclic subgroup generated by x is going to be a subgroup of order p. I said this is really a special case of a more general fact called the Celo's first theorem, which says if g is any finite group, abelian or not, and p is any prime that divides the order of g, then g has an element of order p. And in fact, if a power of a prime, p to the k, divides the order of g, then g will have a subgroup of order p to the k. All right, on to proofs now. What's the proof of the GZ theorem? Okay, so I am going over the proofs in the book, and you can certainly read that and study that, and that would be good. Hopefully, in going over the proof verbally with you, I'm going to give you some insight into how to think through the proof. Might help. So what did the GZ theorem say? It said if this factor group, G mod the center, is cyclic, then G must be abelian. So the goal here is if you make this assumption, we're, we're trying to show G's abelian. Okay, so since that's cyclic, it means it's got to generate. G mod ZG, that factor group, would be generated by some left cosine of the center in the group. There would be some little g in capital G, so that this left cosine generates that assumed to be cyclic group. The goal here is to show that the group is actually abelian, and so we can do that, it turns out, is uh, if we can show that little g is in the center. Why? Because if little g, in fact, is in the center, then this coset, this left coset, is actually the trivial left coset, z of g. g, z, g would equal z of g. And therefore, this factor group is actually trivial. This is going to be the identity element that is generating the group. This factor group being trivial means that g equals its center. In other words, g must be abelian. That's the overall strategy. To do this, given an arbitrary element of A and G, it suffices to show that A and little g commute. Okay, how do you do that? It's just a matter of using things you already know and sort of teasing it out and, and thinking. <clears throat> um, you got this arbitrary element, little a. Consider this left cosine that would be in this factor group. It's in the factor group, which is generated by this left cosine. What does that mean? This is a cyclic group. It means A Z G is some power of G Z G. There's some integer i where this left cosine is a power, an integer power of this left cosine generated. Right? That's just by definition of what a cyclic group is. By definition of cosine multiplication, g z g to the ith power is g to the ith power z g, right? The definition of cosine multiplication is that a h times b h is the left cosine with a representative a b. The left cosine in h of h and g containing a times the left cosine of h and g containing b is equal to the left cosine of h and g containing a times b. H being normal is necessary for this to be a well-defined operation we've seen. We know that centers are always normal. We know we can make this factor group, and this is a well-defined operation. Okay, so I'm just extending this to the ith power. Tease out what that means. Like I said in lecture 19, part A of lecture 19, I think, that would imply this is true. Think about that. I will remind you what I said in lecture 19. Little a is certainly in here. It's certainly in the left coset containing little a because it equals little a times e. The identity is in the center. I'm assuming, or I'm concluding based on what I've done here, that this left coset is the same as this left coset. Since a is in here, it's also therefore in here. What does that mean? It means that this representative g to the i times something in here. G a is g to the i times little z, where z is in the center. 
Again, the goal here is to show little a and little g commute. Feels like maybe we are getting somewhere. I mean, z is in the center, it commutes with everything. g to the i commutes with g. And it should feel like we're getting close to showing a and g commute. And yeah, we are pretty close. Since little z is in the center, it commutes with everything, and therefore it commutes with little g. And therefore, it's also in the centralizer of little g. I haven't talked about centralizers much recently. We did back in chapter 3. The centralizer of an element is the set of all things that commute with that one element. It is a subgroup of the whole group. And in fact, the center is a subgroup of every centralizer for every element. In fact, we saw the center was the intersection of all the centralizers. So z commutes with g. And certainly g to the i commutes with g, so it's also the centralizer of g. The fact that the centralizer is a subgroup of g can now be brought to bear to say this product is by closure, also in the centralizer of little g. Therefore, a is in the centralizer of little g, right here, and therefore a and g commute, and we're done. Okay. Pretty interesting proof, I think. A little bit tricky. But it definitely uses some things that we've been talking about recently. And so you should definitely study it and be able to reproduce perhaps part of it on the test. Coming up in eight days for the 2018 class. Probably not the whole thing, it's probably too long. But maybe part of it, maybe I'd say something related to what you see here. And you'd have to prove something related to what you see here. What about the proof that of the fact that this factor group is isomorphic to the group of narrow automorphisms? That's also in the book, but once again, I hope that I can give you extra insight by talking through it with you. How do you show two groups are isomorphic? You've got to come up with an isomorphism. That's the first thought that should come into your mind when you try to imagine proving this from scratch. So I'm going to define a mapping that I'm hoping will be an isomorphism. At the moment, it's just kind of a hope from this group to that group. But that does beg a question, what should this mapping be? And in a lot of these things, and I've said this before with some other facts that we proved, it's kind of the only possible thing you could even think of, and it does turn out to be, in this case, an isomorphism. What do I mean? Well, take an arbitrary element of this factor group, little g times the center, what could we possibly map it to in the group of inner automorphisms? You have to remember what the group of inner automorphisms is. It's the group of all inner automorphisms where what are those? Those are automorphisms, isomorphisms from the group to itself that can be defined for each A in the group by this formula. So given a, 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 um, a coset like that in the factor group, the only natural thing to map it to in the group of inner automorphisms would be V sub G. I forget if I used a little g or a little a here. I used a little a. Define T of this left coset with little a as the representative to be this inner automorphism defined by that form. That's the only possible thing seemingly non-trivial thing at least, we're not mapping everything to the identity in an automorphism, that you could guess might work. And fortunately it does work. But there's work to do to, to verify that, of course. Just like we've been doing in a lot of things recently, we need to first define, show that T is well defined. Because we get a left coset here, what if, what if we use a different representative? What if the left coset containing A is equal to the left coset containing B. Is the corresponding, are the corresponding inner automorphisms the same? That's the key question. Does this imply that? And actually, if you go the other direction, if you do show it's well defined, does this fact imply that fact? That's important too, because that actually shows that capital T is one to one.
Okay, so let's think through this now. Let's think about what this is equivalent to. This is an equality between left cosets. We know from properties of cosets back in chapter 7 that this is equivalent to A inverse B being in the center. And it's also, if you prefer, equivalent to B inverse A being in the center. And that's a fact about cosets that you can look up back in chapter 7. Um, if, if you're having trouble remembering, like if you're wondering, should the inverse be on the one that's on the left or the one that's on the right? It's the one that's on the left for left cosets. An intuitive way to think this through is to sort of take this equation and multiply both sides on the left, say, by A inverse. To write this, I could have multiplied them to the left by B inverse as well. That's the identity, and that gets sucked into Z of G. I'm not going to try it. Not today. And so we have this equality being true. And that's going to be true if and only if that representative is in the, the subgroup. Okay. With right cosets, the inverse sign goes on the other element, the one on the right. Anyway. Uh, that's in the center. That would be equivalent to saying that A inverse BX equals X A inverse B for all X in G, because it commutes with everything in G. Multiplying both sides of that equation on the left by A and on the right by A inverse, that's equivalent to saying BX B inverse equals AX A inverse which means phi sub b of x equals phi sub a of x for all x and g. From here to here, I multiplied both sides on the left by b and on the, and on, or excuse me, multiplied both sides on the left by a and on the right by b inverse. Okay, we get this equation. And it is true that these things are true for all x and g, which means these functions really are the same. And the implications do work both ways. So going from left to right implies that t is well defined. Two different uh, coset representatives give the same inner automorphism. And going back the other way, since these are the images of these left cosets, Assuming the images under capital T are the same implies that the cosets are the same. That means that T is also one to one. Is T on to? Yeah, that's pretty trivial. Give me an arbitrary phi sub A. What gets mapped to it? Well, that left coset gets mapped to it. Being on to is very trivial. Is capital T operation preserving? It follows from this fact, which we did prove back in chapter 6. If we're trusting that fact, then we could write T of AZG, BZG. By definition of coset multiplication, that's T of ABZG. By the definition of capital T, that's the same as phi sub AB, which by the fact from chapter 6 at the bottom of the slide, that's the same as phi sub A composed with phi sub B. And that's going to be T of AZG times T of BZG. So the key fact is really right there, along with the definition of coset multiplication and the formula for capital T. Okay, we did verify this back in chapter six, so I encourage you to go look it up when, when the book first talks about inner automorphisms. Okay? Or pause the video and think about it yourself on the your own right now. On to the next proof. Lots of proofs in this lecture. This is just going to be an outline of a proof. Outline of the proof of Cauchy's theorem for finite, finite abelian verbs. This one's it's pretty tricky. Um, I think trickier than the last proof we just did. 
I mean, the, the trickiest part of the last proof is coming up with the formula for capital T and realizing you need to show the world the fine thing again. Cauchy's theorem for finite abelian groups uh, is a pretty tricky proof. Here's an, an outline. It, it is a proof by induction, first of all. And the book talks about how combining induction with factor groups is one of the most powerful proof techniques in abstract algebra. Clearly, the theorem is true for a group of order two. Group of order one doesn't have a prime factor, right? We're talking about finite abelian groups, where p is a prime factor of the order of the group, and trying to show it's got an element of order p. If your group has order two, well, if it has order one, it doesn't have any prime factors for the order. If it has order two, two is the only prime factor. It's got an element of order two. It's isomorphic to Z2. The non-identity element is the generator, and it's got order two. So clearly, that's true for group of order two. We're really going to use the second um, principle of mathematical induction rather than the first one, which is not the most typical one used. In the most typical form of induction, you use the fact that the inductive hypothesis assumes something is true for, say, n, and shows it's true for n plus 1. Here we're going to assume that the theorem, Cauchy's theorem for finite abelian groups, is true for all finite abelian groups of order less than the order of the given group, and use that assumption to prove that Cauchy's theorem is also true for the given group. So the given group's got some order. Assume inductively that for all groups of smaller order and a prime dividing that group of a smaller order is going to imply that there's an element of that prime order. That's the big picture of what we're trying to do. You might want to have the book open looking at Cauchy's theorem just to remind yourself of what the statement says as we go through this proof. Um, certainly, the group has an element of some prime order not necessarily p. p is assumed to be the given prime you're thinking about dividing the order of g. There certainly is some prime not necessarily equal to p with an element of that prime order. Why? Well, if you got an element of a of order m, where m is just some unspecified positive integer, bigger than or equal to 2, and well, I'm assuming here that M has got, well, of course, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, M has a prime factorization. There would be some prime, call it Q, that does divide M. There would be some integer K where M is K times Q. Then it would be the case that A to the K would have order Q. I'm assuming A has order M. assuming m is bigger than 1, certainly a to the k to the q power by properties of exponents is a to the kq is a to the m is the identity. And any smaller power, smaller positive power of a to the k would not be the identity since a power of a smaller than m, positive power of a smaller than m would not be the identity. So a to the k would be the element of order q in that case. But q is not necessarily equal to p. That's the point. p is some given prime, not necessarily this other prime that you know for sure might exist. If q does happen to equal p, we're done. Okay. So the interesting case is what if q is not equal to p? Otherwise, what do we do? Form the factor. G mod the cyclic subgroup generated by x, this element of order q. Why? What's the strategy? Because the factor group is going to be smaller than the original group. We're going to be able to apply the inductive hypothesis to it. It's smaller, right? The order of the factor group is the number of left cosets of h and g, which if g is finite, is the order of g divided by the order of h. And if the order of h is bigger than 1, if h is non-trivial, 
This has got fewer elements than G does. It's small. So we can apply the inductive hypothesis to it. Apply the inductive hypothesis to say this group must have an element of order P. Say it's this left coset for some little y in capital G. Now you just need to tease out what that means. And the way to do that, and I think you could come up with this on your own if you think about it long enough, is to raise this element to the p power and see what happens. See if you can conclude that the original group has an element of order p. Maybe that element is y, maybe it's not. Certainly, the identity in the factor group, the subgroup itself, would be this element to the pth power, because that element has order p in the factor group. By the definition of coset multiplication, that means this is true, which means by properties of cosets that y to the p is in the cyclic subgroup generated by x. It's going to turn out that either y itself is the element of order p, or y to the q is the element of order p. If y to the p happens to be the identity element, then y is the element of order p. Any smaller power of y would not be the identity. Because for any smaller power of y here, you would not get this equality. On the other hand, if y to the p is some non-identity element in here, well, the elements, the non-identity elements in there have order q, right? Q is a prime. The cyclic subgroup order q, it's going to have q minus 1 generators. All the non-identity elements in there have order q. So if y to the p is not the identity, then y to the p has order q. So y to the p to the q is the identity, which by properties of exponent is exponents is the same as saying y to the q to the p is also the identity. And it turns out any lower power of y to the q would not be the identity, any lower positive power either. Um, and that's going to imply that y to the q is the element that you seek. It's got order p. And that does Okay. Call this an outline. <laughs> it's pretty much the full proof, of it, other than the fact that I didn't really uh, say what to do here at the end. I just explained it over there. Uh, for sake of time, let's see, maybe I'm going to skip over internal direct products here. I'm trying to finish within about another 20 minutes or so. Um, let me skip internal direct products for the moment. Go on to the main topic of chapter 10. If we have a few minutes at the end, I'll come back to internal direct products. All right, let's go on to this. Group homomorphism and kernel. Let G and G prime be groups. A group homomorphism, not isomorphism, but homomorphism from G and G prime is a mapping that what? It's got to be operation preserving. And that's it. It does not have to be one to one. It does not have to be onto. It might be one to one. It might be onto. But not necessarily. Group isomorphisms are group homomorphisms, but not vice versa. The only condition we require for a homomorphism is that it be operation preserving. That this equation be true. 
when you're using multiplicative notation, of course, corresponding equations would be true for additive notation. What's kernel? Suppose you've got a group homomorphism. The kernel of this homomorphism is the set of all elements of the domain that get mapped to the identity element of the codomain. Say that again. The kernel, we're defining what a kernel is. I should have boldfaced this and that for that matter. The kernel of this homomorphism is the set of all elements in the domain, in G, that get mapped to the identity element of the codomain, E prime in G prime. Symbolically, you can write it like this. The kernel of phi, set of all elements of G, satisfying the property that phi of x equals E prime, the identity element of G prime. This kind of notation is also used. Phi inverse, either with E prime inside sets, a curvy braces for set notation, or E prime by itself. That notation for the kernel, defining the kernel, is also used. You need to be careful, though. Phi inverse, the inverse function of phi may not exist, right? Because phi may not be one to one. Group homomorphisms are not necessarily one to one. So phi inverse may not exist. However, that doesn't stop mathematicians from using this notation. This is called pre-image or inverse image notation. And all it means is it's the set of everything that gets mapped to E prime in this case. In general, when you use this kind of notation, when phi, especially when phi is not one to one, this is going to be thought of as being a set, the collection of everything in the domain that gets mapped to this element of the cardinal. Okay, it is standard notation. So it doesn't mean phi inverse exists as a function. A couple important facts. Here's one. The kernel of any homomorphism is a normal subgroup of the original group. Another important fact is that if phi maps g to some g prime, then the inverse image, the pre-image of g prime, in fact, is a coset of the kernel with representative equal to the original thing that you assumed mapped to g prime. Let's prove these facts. These are pretty important facts. Or just outline the proof. Um, before you show the kernel of uh, phi is normal in G with the normal subgroup test, you really do first need to show it is a subgroup. Okay, if you look at that normal subgroup test, they say in the test, assume you've got a subgroup, assume H is a subgroup of G. It's normal in G if such and such happens. Well, the kernel is not well empty because it does have the identity in it. Uh, that technically does need to be proved. Uh, it's pretty similar to the proof of the fact that the identity got mapped to the identity for isomorphisms. Uh, let's see, you could say it. It's true because this, oh, this notation is confusing too. That's a fee, that's an empty set, by the way, in case that was confusing. The empty set, which is why some mathematicians use this for their empty set instead of a similar kind of symbol. Uh, E's in the kernel sense what? Well, E better get mapped to E prime. In other words, uh, phi of E times an arbitrary element of G prime better be the identity, or excuse me, better be the, that arbitrary element of G prime. Now, okay, I'm, I'm feeling a little confused myself here because what if G prime is not in the image of phi? I didn't think about this ahead of time. Certainly if you had a little G prime that was in the image of phi, there would be some element that got mapped to that g prime, you can use the operation preserving property to say this, and that would essentially do it. But there, that's a problem. How do you know there, there is a little g that maps to g prime? And I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to try to figure it out. Okay. 
it is true the identity is going to get down to the identity under a home um, Suppose you're given two elements in the kernel. Is there product in the kernel? And is the inverse of either of them in the kernel? Or we could do the one step subgroup test and argue why A inverse or A B inverse is in the kernel. And that ends up showing it's closed under both multiplication and inverse taking. You need the fact that phi is operation preserving. To say this, um, I'm not proving it, but it's not hard to prove. And it really is not hard to prove that phi of B inverse is the same as phi of B inverse. And we're assuming A and B are both in the kernel, so both of these equal E prime. So A times B inverse is in the kernel. And the kernel is therefore a subgroup of G by the one-step subgroup test. Is it a normal subgroup? Let A, B, and G, and say K be in the kernel. For the normal subgroup test, I need to verify really that A, K, A inverse is also in the kernel. To verify, I'd be trying to verify that this set inclusion is true. That's the normal subgroup test. So that would be equivalent to showing this is in the kernel. Since phi is a homomorphism, showing I'm skipping one step here, this is equal to this. And since k is in the kernel, this is equal to e prime. Therefore, you get phi of a times phi of a inverse. That's also equal to e prime. And that does it. Okay? And that ultimately shows that k is a normal sub. Oh, the kernel is a normal subgroup of g. No matter what g is and no matter what phi is, as long as it's a homomorphism. I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to bother proving this one. I would encourage you to think about proving that on your own. What I want to do uh, for sure here in the time we have remaining is I want to emphasize two things. Um, you've seen group homomorphisms in the past if you took linear algebra. Linear transformations are group homomorphisms. I have mentioned that vector spaces are groups if you only consider addition you ignore scalar multiplication when you think about vector spaces as being groups. And linear transformations do satisfy this property, I hope you remember from linear algebra, and that is operation preserving property for addition, for the group operation. They also satisfy a certain property related to scalar multiplication, but again, we're ignoring scalar multiplication. Um, if the linear transformation happens to be one to one and not to, then it's also a group isomorphism. But in general, it may not be one to one or on to, and this operation preserving property does still hold, and therefore it's um, going to be a group homomorphism. I should also say that the kernel of a linear transformation has another name. It's also called the null space of the linear transformation. There's a, typically an associated matrix, at least if you're talking about finite dimensional vector spaces. Linear transformations can be represented by matrices. And the kernel of the linear transformation could be labeled as the null space of the linear transformation or the null space of the matrix. So if you took linear algebra, which I think everybody here at Bethel has, that is all related. Let me say one more thing that's related. Amazingly, Here's an example from, of all things, differential equations? What? Isn't algebraic structures about as far away from differential equations as you can get? I mean, it's like there's no differential equations, no calculus-related things in algebraic structures. Well, no, there are some things. OK, 
consider this group, which we've never considered before. Let G be the group of all differentiable real valued functions, say defined on R, the entire real line, under the operation of function addition, not composition here. So I'm adding two functions. Call them, say, f and g. How do I add two functions, f and g? Well, you have to ask, what does it mean to when to add them when you when you plug in a number x? The new function f plus g applied to the input x gives you an output equal to the sum of f of x and g of x. This plus is a sum of numbers. These are two numbers for any given x. This plus is a sum of functions. And it is the group operation of the group that I'm talking about here. Is it really closed? You should, you should realize it is closed. And that's a property of limits, really, based on the definition of the derivative. The sum of two differentiable functions is differentiable. Does it contain an identity? Uh, yes, the zero function, whose graph is the horizontal line on the x-axis, or the, yeah, the x-axis. The zero function is the identity element. Um, do functions have inverses? Yes, they're opposites. The inverse of f applied to an input x is the op gives you an output equal to negative of f of x. So that's the negative of this number, the opposite of the number. And the associative property holds under addition. It is a group. Closure is the hardest thing to verify that the sum of two differentiable functions is differentiable. It's based on a related property for limits. Define a group homomorphism. What is the homomorphism going to be? Well, I could have considered a real simple example, but I wanted a little, a little bit of complexity here. I'm going to consider this function. Take an arbitrary element of g, an arbitrary differentiable function, map it to another differentiable function. By this formula, y here represents a function. This represents the derivative of that function. I'm mapping the function to its derivative minus itself. That's what this mapping is all about. Mapping a function, a real valued function, defined over the entire real line, differentiable function, to its derivative minus itself. If I was using ordinary function notation, f of x, say, I could write phi of f of x is f prime of x minus f of x. I could write that kind of thing. But I'm using y's and y primes because it's more consistent with differential equations. <clears throat> Uh, I claim this is group homomorphism. Is it? It would have to be operation preserving. And it is by linearity of differentiation and algebraic properties of R. Let me go ahead and use the f of x and g of x notation. Phi of f of x plus g of x by definition of this function would be f of x plus g of x prime, the derivative of that sum, minus in parentheses f of x plus g of x. The derivative operator is linear. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. We also have algebra properties of the real numbers. These are real numbers here. I can bring the minus sign through. And then I can rearrange. I can say this is f prime of x minus f of x plus g prime of x minus g of x. And that's going to be phi of f of x plus phi of g of x. And that's verifying that phi is operation preserving with respect to addition. Okay. Linearity property of differentiation is also based on limits. So we are using stuff from calculus that we're assuming we know from the back side. It's a, it's a homomorphism. What's its kernel? <clears throat> What's its kernel? What are the 
What are all the functions that get mapped to zero under this whole warranty? That is a differential equations problem. We're trying to find all functions whose derivatives minus themselves is the zero function. You can also use Leibniz notation, dy dx minus y is zero, or equivalently, dy dx equals y. And if you took differential equations from me, which you very well may have, for those currently and maybe in the future, the general solution to this is an arbitrary constant times e to the x. Actually, you know, I think further on I use t as the independent variable. Let me, let me switch the x to a t here. That's the general solution to this. I'm looking for all functions whose derivatives are themselves, really. This is the general solution. This can be derived using something called separation of variables, but it can also just be thought about, to, although to verify that all, all solutions look like this, it takes a bit, little bit more involving something called the constant function theorem, which is related to the mean value theorem. So there's some, some background stuff that I'm not talking about here, but this is the general solution. And that really, the set of all such functions is really the kernel. The kernel of V is the set of all functions that look like this as C, ranges over po all possible real numbers. These are functions. I'm really abusing notation here by putting the output of the function and thinking of it as being a function. But I hope that's not a problem for you. So that's it's the solution set of this differential equation, is the kernel. What if you had a non-zero thing you were on the right-hand side here? Like, what's the pre-image of that one element set? What if we were trying to solve this differential equation? I am using a t there. Equivalent to this one. Well, there are methods for solving it. And part of the solution does still involve this function right here. But it's not the entire solution set. And in fact, it's, it's not a solution that's in and of itself. I need to add something to it to get a solution. And what you end up doing in differential equations is you, in situations like this, there's a method called integrating factors, but you can also just guess the answer. Um, in differential equations, we call the guessed answer y sub p for a particular solution. And since this is an e to the 3t, you'd want to guess some constant times e to the 3t. But whereas c was an arbitrary constant here, a will not be an arbitrary constant. It will be a particular constant. If you take the derivative of this with respect to t, you get 3a to the 3t. Plug that back up into the differential equation, say the first one up there, do the subtraction. You're going to require 2a e to the 3t to equal e to the 3t for all t. And the only way that's going to happen is if a is 1 half. So it turns out the general solution of this di these differential equations, which are really the same, consists of all functions of the form 1 half e to the 3t plus c e to the 3t, or excuse me, c e to the t, as c ranges over the entire real line. And that actually can be thought of as a coset. This can be thought of as the coset one half e to the three t plus the kernel. Again, I'm using notation here. I'm using the output of the function to represent the function. It's not the best thing to do. And what I'm really illustrating there is the fact at the bottom of the preceding slide. This fact down here. These two things are showing the same thing for that, that example. For that example, phi of y is y prime minus y, is that homomorphism. g prime for the circled situation is e to the 3t. The particular solution is g. yp is 1 half e to the 3t. That's the thing that the coset representative for the coset that is the solution set. I'm using a plus 
sign for the COSEP um, instead of a multiplication because the group operation over there is addition. Okay, it's really saying the same thing. I think that's, if I'm going to meet my goal of finishing what I want to finish, that really pretty much does it. Um, let's see, is there anything quickly I can say? Let me mention a couple quick things. You're not going to understand this just from talking about this for one minute. Okay? But it's worth starting to think about. Something called the first isomorphism theorem. It's a big theorem. It's an important theorem. You got a group homomorphism. It's going to turn out that the factor group of G mod the kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of phi. Both of these notations represent the image of phi. Two different notations for the image. And the natural isomorphism takes an arbitrary coset, G, kernel phi, and maps it to phi of G. So phi bar is going to be this natural isomorphism here that you can prove. A related fact, well, I should also mention that if phi is onto, then this factor group is also isomorphic to G bar. A related fact is that normal subgroups are kernels. Every normal subgroup of group G is the kernel of some homomorphism G. To be specific, to give an example, a normal subgroup N of G is the kernel of something called the projection homomorphism, often labeled with the letter pi, but that, it's not the number pi, it's a, it's a function. Pi starts with P, just like projection starts with P. That's kind of the idea that maps G to this factor group given by taking an arbitrary element of capital G and mapping it to that left cosine. Okay? So that's a real quick introduction to a couple big important theorems. Oh, you know, you've got the skills, if you've been doing well in this class, to prove these facts on your own. The proofs are not that hard. Realizing that these facts were true in the first place was maybe a little tougher. But the proofs of these things are not that hard, and I would encourage you to, to even do it before you do the reading about these in the book. And that's the end of this lecture.